Thank you so much, Jonani, for leading that conversation on climate change. Here at the NATO HQ, we see in the communique that climate change receives a lot of attention. And when you look relatively, climate change has more mentions than China does. So I think many of the issues we just were talking about and the need to focus on might actually come through uh, as NATO takes on this issue more significantly. Thank you for watching us and being with us today. We're entering the last segment of our programming uh, with two exciting sessions coming up. But first, we're going to go to GMF's Berlin office, where we are going to be unveiling and featuring the winners of NATO's first policy hackathon. With that, I'll turn you over to my colleague, Thomas Kleinebrockhoff, the director of GMF's Berlin office. Welcome back to Berlin. Uh, welcome to the studio. My name is Thomas Kleinebrockhoff. I'm the director of the Berlin office here at GMF. And I want to introduce a very special segment of this NATO 2030 at Brussels Forum. With me today, two students, fourth semester students uh, of the Free University of Berlin, Tanja Muschio and Stefan Naumann. Welcome, Stefan. Welcome, Tanya. Um, together with, uh, with teammates, uh, they both are the first winners of the NATO poli policy hackathon. So welcome and congratulations. Now, I have a few questions to both of you, but before we have questions, we have a video and let's listen and let's see the video. Autonomous driving, blockchain technology, artificial intelligence and deep learning. What do these innovations have in common? On the one hand, they all have significant civilian and military value. On the other, they were all developed by the private sector. Gone are the days where the military was at the forefront of innovation, which it would later open for commercial use, as was the case with the internet and the GPS. Today, innovation processes have profoundly changed. In allied nations, innovation is largely driven by the civilian private sector and academia and many products of dual use. To maintain NATO's technological edge, allies need to find new ways to engage with these innovation entities to support the responsible development of emerging and disruptive technologies. To do so, NATO should launch NATO STAR. Through four interrelated steps, NATO STAR will enhance NATO's engagement with academia and private sector to attract young, creative minds and strengthen NATO's technological edge. Let's see how this might look in practice. Meet Sarah, a tech-savvy student from Tallinn University who is looking for an opportunity to develop her idea for optimizing automated image analysis. Sarah's university is part of the NATO Bright Minds community, which facilitates the communication of problem statements to universities and entrepreneurs. In the community, Sarah connects with other ambitious students from across the alliance. They suggest a solution to a problem statement form formulated by NATO personnel related to automated satellite imagery analysis. They succeed and are invited to the NATO Integrated Accelerator. The accelerator identifies promising solutions and fosters such initiatives with tailor-made support. To aid Sarah and her friends to develop a sustainable business model, the program connects them with trusted and certified financial entities from allied nations. Throughout the project development process, the NATO exchange program ensures that the team is in constant exchange with allied personnel, the end users. In this way, there's continuous spillover between creative and operational processes. After developing a minimal viable product, the team can put its software directly to test at the innovation maneuver, an annual field exercise to test a prototype and gather additional data. They do so together with NATO operational staff, tech experts and other invited startups on site. There, their idea is rated as very promising and the exit starts to be scaled up by allied nations in a joint framework. However, operators still identify problems with the recognition of specific patterns. This new problem is then posted as a problem statement on the Bright Minds community platform, where the iterative 
the design process begins anew. And another young specialist like Sarah can find innovative and creative solutions for problems directly experienced by NATO personnel in the field. This way, no potential is lost. If ideas are not ready or proven complete, they are not disregarded but reintroduced into the process as a problem statement. They're not asked for the best way to build a bridge, but for the best way to cross the water. The NATO star brings together conceptual creativity, technological expertise and operational applicability all key ingredients to strengthening NATO's technological edge. Besides fostering innovation, STAR is also about sustaining startup ecosystems, especially in the wake of the financial and economic repercussions of the COVID pandemic. Innovation ecosystems need support more than ever. Supporting startups now will ensure that the developed technologies remain at the benefit of the Alliance in the future. Hence, we call on you to start the process of building a science technology Allied research capability today to ensure that brilliant young minds like Sarah find a way into NATO's future for a better NATO 2030. So, Tanya, we've heard from your colleague uh, Rasmus Dorf. Uh, by the way, I like the candle on that, on that table. Um, now to you. So what was your inspiration to engage with the idea of NATO STAR? Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you very much for having us. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, so I think the idea uh, rose from the fact that we participated in this hackathon, which in and of itself is an exchange of academia and NATO officials and young professionals. So this idea of having an exchange between those actors. Um, and so we thought of how to best connect these actors also to ensure that um, NATO can maintain its technological edge. Um, and ensure innovation within these type of actors. So having the link between academia, um, the private sector and NATO, making it the perfect place to have innovation for NATO 2030. Stefan, um, in the video, Rasmus talked about a responsible, a responsible development of emerging and disruptive technologies. What does responsibility mean in this context? Responsibility means to be able to potentially set global or international standards. But for, to do that, you need to have developed these technologies first and need to be aware of their potential benefits and also potential threats, how they could also disrupt the way that uh, war and military engagement is, uh, is done. But for that, exactly, it's, re it's necessary that uh, allied nations and all allied nations are aware of the disruptive technologies out there, how they can adapt them, and how can, then, how can they then make use of them. In this way, we also think that the NATO STAR program can allow this technology transfer better than it is at the moment between those member states which are very strong on research and development and those who have less capabilities in that regard. And how, how would that work, that technology transferred, especially between the larger and the smaller countries? What are you thinking about that? We are thinking about joint projects by NATO. If, uh, uh, let's say, a promising technology is, uh, does well at the innovation maneuver, and then uh, several member states or allied nations are interested in developing this technology together, then they can also join together uh, with trusted financial entities that are screened previously by NATO or also uh, para-state agencies like France IED, if they are interested to invest in these programs, then they can go ahead and deliver, uh, produce it jointly. It will be a lot easier for a small member state to develop disruptive technology in such a framework with other member states than it would for, uh, be for them alone. And the adaptation process is already included because those who want to adopt it take active part. And uh, Tanya, why would a young creatives engage with NATO? and NATO star? That's a good question that we thought a lot about because it's known that if you have an engineer that uh, gets way more uh, chances in the private sector, so what would be the incentive to join this process? And that's why we thought that the greatest incentive in this, um, in this model is that these young bright minds get taken by the hand through every step, so they have uh, support at every step of this uh, NATO star model. So they get provided with knowledge and very unique data from NATO and also um, with the funding within the accelerator. And then they can have contact directly to the end users, which is uh, NATO allies. And through this field exercise, as Stefan just said, 
um, they get to test their product and their um, their usability of this product. And in case that it's maybe has some issues or problems, it just gets back inserted back into the process, so they know that this problem can be worked on by maybe other students or themselves, and so. Uh, it never gets discarded, but they always get to improve their idea and in the end have a viable product for the allied nations. One of the ideas that Rasmus, your colleague, presented in the video is the fact that technologies are often now not developed by the military, but by the private sector and by university. So how was that hackathon and your engagement received in your university environment, because I will have to confess that the Free University of, of Berlin is a rather unusual spot, at least in what I would have expected for such a prize-winning uh, project. That is uh, absolutely true. And um, well, we were encouraged by our university to join this hackathon. So it came from, uh, from it to this idea that we could participate. So that first step was, of course, coming from our, from our professors. Um, but then winning, we got uh, congratulated by um, the faculty and everything. But since uh, the Freie Universität is very uh, on the left side and has not much experience with NATO topics or doesn't have a chair on security and defense, um, it was rather held low. So we really hope that through this winning of this hackathon, also maybe our participation in this, that the university gets a bit more aware and maybe, um, yes, improves how uh, students and research and technology are seen. And Stefan, what will you take away from this experience that you've had with this hackathon and with this engagement in, with NATO and the university? I think one thing I will take away is that the ingredients that we put into our end product also helped us a lot in developing our ideas. So concurrent design and uh, the idea of an iterative innovation process, that is also part of how we approach uh, uh, the topic and I think we were able to uh, really achieve some very interesting results and uh, uh, very good ideas. So if you think that our uh, results uh, are interesting and maybe uh, go in a direction that NATO should develop, then this is a strong argument to engage further with uh, civil society and academia through such programs such as the hack hackathon and the process of NATO 2030. Thank you. Um, and you talked about civil society earlier today. Uh, the German Marshall Fund together with NATO uh, hosted a group of 35 young leaders to debate some of the core th themes of NATO 2030. We talked about that before. And this group uh, also talked about the topic of our conversation, which is innovation and security. And they also, like you had uh, said, uh, uh, moved uh, NATO to think more flexible in this, in this realm. And it became clear in that conversation that there is a, a set of values here, better engagement, transparency, understanding, uh, and, and trust between NATO and stakeholders like your university is critical. Uh, and they appealed to NATO uh, to keep this proactive spirit. Now, with that, I want to hand the virtual mic over uh, to Molly Wood. Uh, she's quite a distance away from Berlin. Uh, and that is in, uh, on the west coast of the U.S., and she will lead a panel discussion on emerging disruptive technologies. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It is, uh, as I believe you heard, morning where I am, but I understand we're the last session of the day. So we are going to endeavor to keep you entertained, upright, engaged. It's going to be fantastic. My name is Molly Wood. I'm from the U.S. National Public Radio Show Marketplace. And as you saw, of course, we're here to talk about this new age of innovation and technology and the opportunity and also the security threats that disruption can create. As I'm sure you have heard all day, the world of technology is changing very quickly by the Alliance's own admission, own admission, 
NATO has some catching up to do. On the agenda, of course, for this week's summit, the Secretary General has laid out plans for a new innovation fund to support startups, innovation centers to create more cooperation between partner countries. The first new cyber defense policy in seven years is on the table, which seems like good timing. And this is all happening against the backdrop of this incredibly fast moving development in all kinds of areas, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, biotechnology, autonomy, cyber attacks on critical infrastructure, a pandemic that had a, has us thinking a lot harder about preparedness and resilience. And of course, as again, I believe was discussed all day, we all have become victim and notice the fragility of supply chains that deliver crucial components, whether it's PPE or semiconductors. So a central question for the Alliance and then the security arena is who controls these technologies? Much of the development is in member com much of the development in member countries is in private industry. A lot of it is happening in China. It is a lot of ground to cover and catch up on, which not for nothing is also a challenge for NATO. So let's dive right in with our panel today. Leanne Carre is CEO of Boeing's Defense, Space, and Security Division, a $34 billion department with customers all over the globe. Lieutenant General Thomas Sharpie is the Deputy Chief of Staff for Capability Development at Allied Command Transformation. Its charter within NATO is to, among other things, define the future military context, identify challenges and opportunities in order to innovate and maintain a warfighting edge. Daniel Korski is CEO of Public, which launched several years ago to develop tech startups that work on public services. Mr. Korski is a former advisor to former British Prime Minister David Cameron. He said he started public because governments are falling behind. And finally, Amy Webb, a futurist and president of the Future Today Institute, who uses data and deep analysis to advise companies, governments, central bankers, intergovernmental organizations on what's coming next in science, technology, and society. All right, so that you know what is coming, we're gonna get started right away with questions. We'll have a little conversation about these topics and what else we uh, might be missing or need to be aware of immediately. And we will, of course, take some questions from the audience. I wanna kick us off by starting with terror, I guess, because it's the last session of the day. So I wanna raise your intensity right off the bat. Um, I wanna ask each of the panelists to answer this question, which is, you know, what is keeping you up at night? What is the innovation that you fear NATO and its member countries may be behind the curve on that we need to get up to speed on immediately? I'm going to go in the order of my Zoom, at least, and start with you, Leanne. Well, Molly, thank you so very much for the opportunity uh, to join this great panel today and really express my appreciation to uh, the German Marshall Fund for allowing us this time together. In terms of what keeps uh, me up at night, it is all about what the customer needs. Uh, we at the Boeing Company are very focused in making certain that we can provide the capabilities that they need at the time that they need. And it all centers around that word, time. How many of y'all wish that there was uh, more than 24 hours in a day and how could we capitalize on it? And so our job is to um, have that conversation front and center and a way we're approaching it is about focusing on the how. We can chase what's all day long and actually never get to that because technology is advancing so fast. But if we can deliver product, if we can reimagine how we can go from concept to fielding and support for NATO and for the allies around the world, we're gonna actually create time. And so that really is um, our focus is uh, making certain that we can in this more for less environment, provide more and help enable the customer. And again, thanks for the time today. Lieutenant General, I'll move on to you next. Yeah, hey, again, thanks for the opportunity to be here, as Leanne said. It's an honor to be with this distinguished panel. Um, I, I, from my perspective, the thing that keeps me awake at night is, is how do I leverage the collective wisdom that's ongoing in the science technology field and academia and with our industry partners to ensure that we maintain the advantage that we have in our military instrument of power. It's about trying to leverage the coherence that is ongoing between all of those different entities and then to multiply that by the 30 nations. And so there's opportunities that abound, but I just try and worry and it keeps me awake as to how do I bring all of that together to make the sum of the 30 nations greater than individual parts, which is the strength of that alliance and making sure that we use all of those um, capabilities that are out there 
whether it be in industry and academia and science, to be able to leverage those in support of our military instrument of power and doing that correctly at the speed of which is being led by industry. And I think, you know, the what and the why, I think we agree with. How do we do that? That's what keeps me awake at night. Thank you. Amy, you're next in my box. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to, to serve on this panel. I have a pretty specific concern, and that is that NATO um, is fighting yesterday's war. Uh, we are at a point at which AI is just now really being talked about in a significant way when policy hasn't been updated uh, in seven years. And here we are at the cusp of cyber biohacking and cyber biological warfare. China has demonstrated time and time again that it no longer uh, intends on being the world's factory, but rather it, it intends on being a militaristic, economic, and diplomatic pacing threat when it comes to both artificial intelligence and those biotechnologies that fall within the bioeconomy, which include things like synthetic biology, genome manipulation, and CRISPR. Um, and, you know, we have malware um, attacks that have already been proven. Uh, we have clear links between China's largest uh, genetic sequencing companies and the PLA, which maintains supercomputers to process genetic information. It's well documented that the PLA sponsors research now on genetic engineering and performance enhancements and, and other offensive capabilities specifically designed for war fighting, um, <laughs> for the war fighting domain. Uh, and there are a strikingly high number of CRISPR trials that are taking place at medical institutions affiliated with the PLA. The biggest concern, though, that I have is the, the lack of coordination. Um, in, the, in the private space, uh, we've been fighting over GMO fra frameworks now for a very long time. This is going to be much more complicated once it hits the public domain because so much of the work is being driven by the, public, uh, by the private sector. Um, so. Told you. Daniel? <laughs> Let me pick up uh, <clears throat> on some of the things Amy said, because what really frightens me is the contrast between a number of technological trends on the one hand, of which I think the advance in artificial intelligence and machine learning is, if you will, um, ceteris paribus above all else, um, and um, as well as the changing nature of humanity is what I'd sort of describe what Amy is referring to in, as biohacking. And what does the soldier of tomorrow look like if they could be enhanced? But I'd add to that a number of other things, the transformation of space as a domain of where we where we operate in a way that that allies and enemies, new contestants can operate in, a, in this dimension and at a, at a cost that, that just wasn't possible before. And finally, I want to add something else, which is the sort of lack of transformation of core resources, you know, the RAF today uh, uses as much fossil fuel as Reading you know, Bristol uh, and Cambridgeshire all put together. Uh, and as we face a massive, you know, climate change crisis, it does worry me that uh, today's militaries uh, have, have been incapable of making the adjustment. So that's on the sort of, what are you scared about? Because these things are accelerating. But, but the thing that makes me really worried is I don't then see governments being able to adapt um, you know, as fast. I think it's fantastic to talk about the creation of a NATO innovation fund and an accelerator program. I mean, you know, there have been innovation funds since the 1950s in the U.S. military. Uh, accelerator programs are, you know, 25 years old um, and exist in so many other domains. Um, procurement systems, which is an issue I hope we can get into, have been fundamentally unupdated in, you know, in NATO for years. So to me, to sum up, what I fear is the acceleration of some of the technological innovations while we are still so slow bureaucratically and institutionally to operate differently where it matters. Yeah, it seems as though we have circled back around to both what and how, I think, you know? And so I wanna come back to you, Leanne and Lieutenant General and, and say, what is the, the filtering mechanism? Like if you're focused on, your, on serving your customers, is the customer dictating the what? And similarly, when it comes to the military, is the private industry dictating the what? So even if that's not your focus, how do we decide on it? Cause it does seem like there's a big sort of sense of everybody panicking about a lot of different, very real things. 
and how do you choose what to focus on? Well, Molly, how, how about I start and then I'll turn it over to General Sharpie. Uh, one of the opportunities uh, that we have as we work together as industry in support of the government is recognizing that technologies come from both places. Uh, there's this belief that it's only going to be driven by government or it's only going to be driven by industry. And the reality is it isn't an or, it's an and. And so it is about bringing uh, what is best from the commercial sector and applying it and adapting it to what can be used for military purposes. With that also comes uh, how you make sure that um, it is used with the right intent. Um, are the policies as you work across nations, um, is there the policies and strategies that allow us to uh, work together and to scale it? And then how are you going to sustain it? But in order to do that, there's really three things in my mind that are required. First is cooperation. And so there first has to be an understanding that we are going to do things multinational and that we are going to have an and between uh, the commercial and the military industry. And so having policies and strategies that can bridge back and forth are key. The second element in my mind is collaboration. And collaboration is more than the good intent to work together. It's actually as you cross uh, lexicons between uh, commercial and defense, you really need to get common definition. Because what, uh, what may uh, be uh, understood on, through a defense lens may be something that is not understood well on the commercial lens. And that can range from, as Daniel said, from procurement systems all the way to product delivery to new technologies. And then finally, uh, the third point for us is interoperability. And it's not just the interoperability of the nations using whatever those products and services it may be, but it goes back to having standards and reciprocal relationships. Because if you're really going to leverage what's going on in the commercial industry, what you want to make certain of is that you're not redoing it and spending more money and more time to go certified in it through a defense lens when you could literally lift and place. And so cooperation, collaboration, and interoperability are really fundamental uh, in my mind. General, what do you think though, when you hear about this list of priorities, how high is, is biotech? How high is you know biology as weapon on, on your list? Well, I, I, it, it, it's on the list, but I think that, you know, some of the things that the answer I want to just pull the string on a little bit, you know, for us at Allied Command Transformation, we don't necessarily buy tanks and airplanes. You know, those are provided by nations and they provide those capabilities. Our job is to help set those standards, to set that interoperability platform so that those capabilities that are provided by the nations are enabled to be able to operate together and maintain what, what I call that strength of the alliance. So. Uh, individual capabilities are great, but interoperable capabilities is really what we need to get after. And ensuring that we set those standards of interoperability make the most sense. Uh, talking about the warfighter, the warfighter, when we do our requirements, I don't like the word requirements, I'll say when the warfighter sets the need, um, our process in the past used to be, you could set a need and go to industry and go to the procurement process and come back 10 to 15 years later, and the warfighter would get a product that they would deliver and see whether it meets the needs. In today's environments, we put the, the operator um, and the coders in the room together to make sure that we are writing it together and that they validate every step of the process to ensure that what we are delivering for them, those standards, those interoperability standards are being met or exceeded so that they can get a product that they need before, during, and after the process as opposed to waiting to the end. And then that means we also have to ensure that the procurement processes, the policies keep pace with the uh, technological uh, speed at which things are being delivered. And I think it's the key is those interoperability standards that we have to maintain with the warfighter driving that process throughout the entire conundrum from the beginning to the end. Uh, I'll stop there. Hopefully that answers part of that question. Well, Daniel, I see you already raising your hand. I know yeah. that this, this question of speed is sort of central to what you're trying to do with public, right? I wanted to come in because I wanted to take a little bit of issue with, with some of the things that Tom is saying, not least because it's late in the evening and we better get a good discussion going. But what Tom effectively described was a focus on the user need. You know, what is the user need? Let's sit down with the user. Let's work out what they need. And that's a great tenant in software, which, by the way, is going to be the predominant sort of... Um, issue uh, in, 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 in equipping NATO and its uh, allies with, with new, uh, 
you know, new weaponry and so on. Software development is going to be core to what we all do. And user need is a hugely important. But, you know, there's a great saying by uh, by Henry Ford. He said, if I asked, uh, you know, people what they wanted, they would have asked, said, you know, faster horses. And, and, and similarly, in a modern age, Steve Jobs didn't go around saying, would you like me to remove all the keys on the on the on your phone and put just a button or no button? No, he he intuited that that was going to be the direction of travel. And I think the fact that Tom is still talking about the user need as this amazing transformative way in which we now buy things, I'm being a bit provocative here, is 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 in a sense a great illustration of the problem because we are not allowing a system to exist where people, uh, whether they come from the inside or outside, can say, no, it's going to be like this. It's going to be the T model. It's going to be the iPhone with a button in it. And, and the kind of interchange between those innovators who can articulate that and develop that and buyers is, is that, that, that conversation is very difficult unless, I'm sorry to say, you're not one of the large primes. Um, so, and since we know that every industry around the world has been totally transformed over the last 20 years, not by existing prime contractors, but by new emerging companies, what is the way in which we can allow for that dialogue? And that's really what I wanted to kind of like push back on. Can I just um, offer an observation from the outside? You know, in order for NATO to remain relevant, and I think that's part of the point of this week in talking about, you know, um, talking about the alliance and innovation. You know, one of the challenges that I would put forward is that you have to anticipate what's on the horizon. And you are not, as an organization, going far enough out. And all of the, the ancillary pieces of the ecosystem are similarly um, perfecting the art of incremental improvements. Um, I'd like to tell you a story about what happened last year. There, were, there was a team of academic researchers that demonstrated an end-to-end -end biological cyber attack um, that should have been on everybody's radars. Now, I, I know that it was with some, um, some parts of, of uh, our defense capabilities, but the challenge is that unwitting biologists were tricked into generating dangerous toxins in their labs. They, they designed using a computer system, um, a genetic sequence that was sent to another place, a company, um, and in the process, malware was able to replace code on a bioengineer's computer. Um, and if the process had completed, a neutral genetic sequence would have gotten returned as a toxic one um, back in the mail. Here's the problem with this. This may sound like super futuristic technology. And to be fair, some of, this, some of the capabilities are being worked on by advanced research groups throughout the forces around the world. The problem is a procedural one. We do not currently have the capability to figure out what to do in that situation. We don't in the United States. Certainly the, um, the, the, the partners, the global partners don't know how to react in that situation. We, we have to do a better job at sussing out and assessing risk in the near term, which is happening, and where to put those innovation dollars while at the same time doing a much much better job of much broader thinking and bigger scenarios that anticipate change in these newer areas. Because I can tell you that that is what some of the adversaries um, to, to, to democracy are in the process of doing. And we cannot be in a situation yet again that we have been with artificial intelligence where we are playing catch up when we're talking about bio, a new form of biological warfare that's going to be much, much more difficult to contain. Jump back in just to Daniel. I think you said it more eloquently than I did, but it wasn't provocative. You're exactly right. What I, what I was trying to say is the requirement is faster horses. The need is getting from point A to point B. And so we're trying to understand what that need is and then deliver something that's better than we have. And then eventually through that refinement, through that spiral development, using agile methodologies to try and deliver things. You know, we try to enable that by using the NATO Industrial Forum, um, doing industry days and bringing in industry to say what our need is. And my experience has been many times they deliver more than you actually thought you could because of what they bring to the table and understanding that what is good, you may even get better if you can do that and go beyond that need to get you something better than what is you thought you were actually your requirement was. And so, but it's just, you know, it's a challenge because 
in our current procurement process in NATO, you start with an operational requirement statement. And that means you know what you need. My experience is based on you don't, because if you have something, you might get more than what you actually thought you could by leveraging your partners. Over. Just jumping in quickly and, um, and not to sort of focus it all on this dialogue, but simply to say um, what you're talking about, but frankly also um, what Amy and Leanne were referring to was a, a different level of intelligence on behalf Uh, well, I will sum up any comments that you may have missed while our audio was out, but essentially it seems like we are honing in in some ways on a conversation about centralization versus decentralization, which is something, you know, that w agility, how much coordination can occur before it slows down a process. So that separate, even from the conversation about priority setting and innovation, how can you scale solutions in a way that's still relevant. And I see our general already chuckling at this. So I know this is something you're thinking about. It, is it possible to coordinate a response across 30 countries anymore? I think it is possible. I think that we are in the midst of trying to do that right now. Um, the things like the, you know, the NATO 2030 that the Secretary General talks about, you know, that's the whole impetus behind this meeting was recognizing that we're in a competitive environment. We have to go faster. We can't use the processes of the past to be relevant into the future. What's good enough today might not be good enough for tomorrow. And trying to get that consensus decision making sometimes is a challenge, but we're trying to get after it. We've done many things here at Allied Command Transformation to try and speed uh, the time that it takes to deliver products. We've applied the DevSecOps approach. Um, you know, we do DevOps really well. The security piece to get it accredited to put things onto the network is still a challenge but we continue to do that and we're trying to maintain that pace that we need you to keep it, keep up because our adversaries, um, they have a more lean system when it comes to decision-making and getting a decision at 30, um, it sometimes can be challenging, but we're working through it. And the secretary general, you know, after the summit, I'm sure there's gonna be some tasks on how do we accelerate those decisions, especially when it comes to acquiring and procuring uh, those capabilities that we must have to maintain relevance uh, in this competitive world we find ourselves in. There are going to be solutions that come from private industry. There may, you know, there are going to be solutions that come from government. Leanne, you, you referred to this kind of partnership that has to happen, but how big do you think the gap is right now in terms of agility and solutions that are coming from private industry, but that may not frankly serve the interests of a global audience? Because at the end of the day, a company has to look out for itself. So Molly, from, uh, from my perspective, again, it goes back to that uh, point around the end, not everything that uh, industry develops from a commercial application is going to have uh, relevance uh, to the military or to militaries uh, around the world. And as General Sharpie was indicating, you know, you're bringing forward a consen uh, consensus of nations together um, who are uh, working to have alignment in how they want to address uh, the different threat scenarios. 
what we have found uh, ourselves is that we need to bring forward proof points. Um, and so as we bring forward ideas of new technology, as we bring forward uh, these pivotal changes in terms of how we do things faster or um, that, uh, that costs less or will change the paradigm for how they, um, we operate in the future, um, just saying that it's different and that will, it will work isn't the same as bringing forward those proof points. And so what we've focused our time and um, a lot of our R&D effort in goes back to that how into generating those proof points. And so for example, um, having a new weapon system that can fly, we have been able to demonstrate uh, now four times that we have cut that timeline in half by 50%. We have been able to uh, demonstrate that through uh, different types of manufacturing uh, techniques, whether it is additive, uh, whether it's bringing in uh, different workforce um, engagements, we've been able to reduce uh, assembly times by 80%. But the government, like all customers, they need to actually see that they're getting value for money. And so part of this as industry is when we have these great ideas, uh, bring it forward in a way that they can see that proof point and how it can be used, whether through modeling and simulation or through other, uh, through other instances where they can see some of the value. Because sometimes I, I, you have to be able to see how it will fit in in a larger perspective in order to get that aha moment that is needed. And I think that's where uh, forums like this can bring us together to have those conversations. Daniel, I know that uh, incubating companies that work in public service is part of your solution strategy, at least faster, more efficient, but do the incentives align? I think that is still a fair question to ask about private industry versus problems that only governments or even alliances of governments can solve. So there's good and bad here. Uh, on the one hand, we are at a stage of the internet revolution where people are beginning to wonder about um, you know, how they can develop things beyond getting a pizza to you faster or uh, you know, change the uh, download speed times on your favorite porn site. You know, people care about the big transformative issues of our day, uh, and they would like to apply themselves. And that particularly goes uh, for software engineers. They would like to apply themselves to issues that matter. Uh, and in and amongst those issues is the protection of the realm of which NATO and defense establishments that are part of NATO is a subset of that. So on the one hand, we have the opportunity to sell the mission to a cadre of people, engineers, product managers, uh, would-be founders, uh, who are open to hearing the message that, that they can go off and spend their time on building something genuinely valuable. On the other hand, um, it is incredibly hard, and we've touched on this, to actually um, be allowed to build something that, uh, you know, not just something that sees the light of day, but that, that, that can then be put to good use. You know, developers, uh, company founders, well, what we really want is to develop something that actually is put in the hands of somebody and makes a difference. You know, we don't just want to write uh, PowerPoint presentations. We leave that to the big consultancies. Uh, and so there is this massive challenge. And one answer of which has been, oh, let's pilot these things. Let's give small seed uh, uh, grants to, to companies to do it. And that's fantastic. It's great. It's often the only way that somebody from the outside or somebody who's been on the inside and has gone on to the outside can, can get a word in edgewise. But uh, there is a joke. You'll soon end up with more... Uh, you know, pilots at NATO than the combined air forces have. These these pilots have to turn into real projects. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the militaries of the alliance need to think very carefully, how do we take something, you know, into a process um, with very little bureaucracy? Uh, we, we had a question from, uh, I think it's Anne Moisen, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, that went to the, the point about um, capabilities that are not just... Uh, that are not just developed uh, by the state, but also by non-state actors who are more agile. And I think this is this is a hugely important point because we're not just facing the might of the PLA and the and, and the Russian, you know, uh, scientific defense industrial complex. We're also facing a number of nimble actors who can who can hack their way to a solution, combine it with something that is maybe um, you know commoditized, and suddenly send you know very cheap AI-controlled drones in order to destroy you know, our ability to take, even get out of harbor. And, and when you're facing something like that, you know, how, I, there is enormous value to working with people who think similarly. I have no money, I have almost no staff, 
Um, I've got to hack my way to the solution. Um, how do I think and outthink my opponent? And it's not to say that large corporations can't do it. Of course they can. But I, I think, uh, you know, if you're facing particularly threat Anne is talking about, it's worthwhile having your own, uh, you know, to put it provocatively, your own Al-Qaeda cells of innovation that are able to, to operate in that way. I just saw Amy pop back on for a moment. We had lost her video feed. I know that you have been chomping at the bit back there. How do you know the companies that you're advising tackle this question of agility versus running into a layer of bureaucracy that you have to fight through in order to have a globe-sized solution? Right, so it's my observation. M most of the work that I do is with very large corporations and, and bigger government agencies. Um, the challenge that is that these organizations are set up for tactics and strategy. Um, it is a, a di very different thing to think through the longer term transformation. Uh, and that keeps getting short shrift um, because there's a growing sense that there's too many uncertainties. We cannot manage all of, all of the change at once. So we're gonna work on the incremental fixes that, that we know uh, will, will lead to wins. At some point um, in every organization, the system breaks down. And so it's good to adopt a scrappy, a scrappy uh, sensibility and to try to accomplish what can be accomplished in the name of, of uh, building agility into decision-making processes. It's good to come up with, with coordinated uh, frameworks it's also important to bear in mind that the external threats to democracy and to peace are shifting in ways that they have not before in modern human history, which means that we need more sophisticated approaches. Um, you know, some of that is thinking through the implications of policy in advance. We haven't yet mentioned the regulatory challenges. There are growing tensions between the EU's regulation when it comes to artificial intelligence autonomous technologies, synthetic biology, um, what, what's happening in the United States and what's happening in China. And ultimately, even though that is external to the work that NATO is doing, it does have an impact because at some point it impedes the ability for corporates to do their work, for you to manage your supply chains and for us to manage the threats that are on the horizon. There is plenty of opportunity the bioeconomy is not all doom and gloom. It is why we have vaccines in, in such short time for COVID. And it's on par to be, it's, it's gonna grow to trillions of dollars. Um, so, so there's a lot that's good that's happening, but if we don't seriously model and map dual use technologies and potential next order uses, and if you're not factoring in that to your procurement process and thinking through what might be next in a broader way, um, that then my, my biggest concern is that all of the agility in the world isn't going to solve for the looming threats brought by these technologies and our inability to keep pace with them. Yeah, Leanne, I wanna come back to you on that, on, on this idea of turning big ships. You are, you're in a big ship, your division alone is $34 billion. How do you incorporate that thinking, that modeling, that, that agility, and that sort of ability to respond quickly? It, it, you, know, you, you talked a little bit about digitization. I know that that's part of it, but I know that can't be the only thing. Yeah, no, Molly, it's a great question. And frankly, I wanna um, you know, build upon what Amy just shared. Uh, you can get so caught up in the moment and facing the objectives of today, uh, one of the um, focus elements for us was to, in many ways, uh, stop playing a, a follower, ro follower role uh, to defense budgets. Uh, because if you just follow defense budgets, you're going to make, to Amy's point, and I know General Sharpie will, uh, will see this, you're going to make uh, tactical decisions that really reflect what you've always done in the past. And so for us, what we have uh, focused on in several years ago, we made, we, we really um, decided to change our approach, which was again, back to, for us, it was about how do we produce emerging and disruptive technologies in a way that can scale, that can actually provide real benefit within short order that the warfighter can use, that partner nations will look at. And it started with a how. 
and the how went back to the policies and practices. It went back to our procurement practices. It went back to our supply chains. It went to how we approached regulators. And frankly, it went back to the tool sets that we were using in terms of what did we want from a mental model going forward. This is as much a cultural change for a corporation as it is a decision change in terms of what you're going to go pursue next. And, and so for us, again, it was all of the elements of the how, and we had to actually just step back and pause and say, uh, how are we going to really make a difference for the future? And some uh, examples of how we have done that just this past week, uh, you saw history making a first time and uncrewed autonomous aero refueling, uh, refueling a, a crewed fighter jet never happened. The technology has been out there. The enablers have been there, but it's about making that proof point real and working through the regs, the policies, the confidence level of the customers, and being able to bridge something that can take what should have already happened into scale. And so that's really what we're trying to do. Um, and, and to your point, Molly, it is no easy feat changing a uh, ship, moving a ship, but we have to be aligned on what it is uh, that we're actually chasing. And that's why we just we just did a mental shift there. Thanks. We have about 10 minutes left, so I wanna make sure I get to some of the questions that are coming in, in the chat, but also some of these sort of specific questions about threats. A little, we're just gonna do a little bit of what and who for a moment. You, I think we've gotten a lot of how though, so good job this panel. You, you know, it's interesting, they're almost competing questions in the chat right now. One from Puree asking, why is NATO not adopted EDT applicable to cyber defense, such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, autonomy, and 5G? And simultaneously, a question saying, well, how do you intend to deal with technologies that will connect everyone and intertwine our societies so profoundly, making us therefore more vulnerable? How big of a rock and a hard place is this situation? I see you nodding, General. You're thinking about this one? Absolutely. I mean, you know, so, so I want to go back to something Daniel said, and I'll tie it in. You know, Daniel said that we're trying to change humanity. I think we need to change the workforce. Um, you know, part of the things we've tried to do is trying to change, adapt some of these strategies and policies for AI, EDTs, as an example. Um, we tried to convince the, bureau, the, the processes in NATO to change, and we weren't very successful because I realized very quickly that they didn't understand. So we need to educate and increase their understanding. And then once we got to that basic understanding, then ask or convince them to try and make changes to the policies to enable us to be able to deliver things faster. It's a challenge, you know, the connecting part of this. You know, we all talk about multi-domain operations. You know, how do you connect sensors, shooters, platforms, people, decision makers to be able to make the right decisions? You know, we're trying to do that, but it's a slow process. I know that it's not a technology problem. Sometimes it's a policy and a will problem. But if they don't understand it and they can't see the benefits of it, they're changing the policies is going to be hard. And so it's incumbent upon me and my role to try and educate and coach so that we can get to those changes that are needed in order to be able to connect and do things at speed, at scale, so that we can deliver to the hands of the warfighter before they need it. Because delivering it after they need it, we're too late. Could I just ask a quick question? What happens if in the year 2030, war doesn't look like it did previously. We're talking about a, when I, when I hear people talk about war fighting capabilities, it assumes that we are gonna be fighting wars in the future that follow the same mental model and parameters as wars we fought in the past. And the question that I would posit is, what happens when we're fighting against algorithmic determinism created by a rogue cell or a rogue individual that potentially was designed with malintent or just was an accident? What happens when we have a dual use technology across any different realm um, that, that sets off serious economic challenges that in a way prevent us from succeeding, but aren't defined using the, using the traditional uh, definitions of, of warfare? This is, the, this is something that I, I, would, I would be curious to know what that mental model looks like, because I, again, I know that the procurement process takes a really long time. I know funding takes a long time. I'm on the Hill talking to people about this. It's really hard to move that, that enormous ship, but we're in a situation where we, we may not have a choice. So I would just be curious to know what, what everybody's thinking about that. 
I'd say we're there now. I mean, there's examples right now that are going on. We're in a contested environment in space and cyber. Just look at some of the things that have happened with the oil and gas and other areas. It's happening today, you know, and NATO is trying to be out front of those things, but it just takes time. You know, we we Article 5 and now with cyber and dealing with how do you make a declaration in the cyber environment? We're morphing and changing to try and do that. But it's going to take all of us, not just some of us. You have very valid points. And so, you know, I think this forum is how we start to learn and figure out how to do that and how to turn that ship so that we can be faster. And I won't hog it, so I'll, I'll, I'll give up the mic. Leanne, why don't I go to you and then Daniel, this seems like a great place to kind of take us out in just the last couple of minutes, which is we all, we do all have to work together, right? We have to get over, it's very hard to live in the future and see it coming and be frustrated with the pace. And yet we have to assume that everyone at least knows what to worry about. And then the question is right back where we started, how? So Leanne, I'll leave it to you. And then Daniel to sort of close us out on this question of, Great. How do we all pull together faster? <laughs> well, first, Molly, again, thanks so very much for the opportunity today. Um, and I think something that uh, every uh, one of the panelists has um, referenced, which is about the people involved in the process, whether it's our workforce, whether it's the users, uh, whether it's uh, the public and the communities and the nations in which we live. Um, the threats that Amy outlined are real, they're happening today. I mean, the conversation we have within our four walls is that uh, war fighting today and war fighting tomorrow do not look the same. Uh, we may use some of the same language, but that doesn't mean that, uh, that it is the same context. And so I think making certain that we have uh, that cooperation, having that collaboration and having that interoperability and having uh, some of the shared uh, shared. Um, uh, words and the lexicons about what it is that we're facing and anticipating facing will allow us uh, to get there faster together. Thank you. Daniel, you started a company based on the premise that we're not going fast enough. What do you think? Well, I mean, I think this has been a very rich conversation. Um, and it seems that you're attempting us again to think into the future, but sometimes you get the best perspectives by thinking back into the past. Uh, and what I mean by that is to say, if you think back to how militaries operated during the Second World War, there was an extraordinary fusion of civilian and military collaboration. Uh, people like Amy were, you know, literally yanked off the streets and were given stars on their shoulders and told to get on solving some of the huge problems that the military uh, were facing at the time. What, uh, what then has subsequently happened is we have gone back into these different silos and that worked for the, you know, for the Cold War and to a degree even the post-Cold War. But as we face some of the challenges that Amy's talking about, uh, that Leanne uh, referenced, we're going to have to work hand in glove in an integrated fashion. We, who we are on one hand, and we, who we are on the other hand, are, are going to change. You know, it might be me sitting in Tom's chair, maybe not wearing his uniform as well as he is, um, but 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 with the stars, if, if even if imaginary, on my shoulders, and him in my startup building things, because unless we try to achieve that different level of fusion, which we saw in our past so successfully apply, uh, you know, to use Churchill's phrase, the overwhelming force correctly, uh, then we're not going to be able to address some of these problems because the answers are not within the NATO framework. They're not within our defense establishment. They're not inside militaries. And I'd even argue that they're not even inside the defense industrial partners that we operate with despite their enormous capabilities. They're even beyond that. And that's what we need to change. All right. On that note, I'm going to call that a plea for teamwork. Let's try to end on a positive note amid so much global division. Thank you so much to this wonderful panel. This is incredible. Uh, all of you in Brussels have made it through the day. We're going to go back to Brussels for concluding remarks from Ian Lesser and Alexander de Croo, Prime Minister of Belgium. Thanks so much again, everyone.
Welcome back to Brussels. Uh, once again, I'm Ian Lesser from GMF here in Brussels. It, it's been an extraordinary day here, an historic summit, uh, by all accounts, an extremely successful one, uh, and a terrific day of conversations at NATO 2030 at Brussels Forum. Uh, and we get to conclude the day, uh, and we're really very delighted to have with us uh, the Prime Minister of Belgium, Alexander de Croo. Uh, Prime Minister, thank you for joining us. Thanks for taking the time at the end of a very busy day. Thank you for, uh, for having me at the end of the day. Oh, our pleasure, our pleasure. Um, you know, not surprisingly, we just thought it would be very nice to take a few minutes and, and hear a bit your own reflections of, on the day and what you heard, uh, what uh, struck you, maybe what surprised you. Um, Prime Minister, thanks. Well, I think that th th this summit, uh, the build-up to this summit was, was a positive one. Eh? We, we, we knew that the message coming from the United States was, was kind of uh, diametrical as opposed to what we have been hearing over the last, uh, over the last years. I think uh, President Biden arriving yesterday on the tarmac of the airport, he was already um, quite open about basically saying um, America's back. Um, and, and I think that that got elaborated more in detail during the meeting uh, today. Uh, I think that um, uh, President Biden really set, uh, set the tone at the start of this discussion by making uh, very clear how important NATO is in uh, the way the United States looks, uh, looks at the world, uh, made it very clear that uh, U.S. leadership was going to be more stable, more predictable, something that the rest of the world could build on. And I think if you look back at the, at the last four years, I mean, a lot of things could be said about the last four years, but one of the issues is that in a chaotic world that is changing so fast, if you get too many surprises, and, and I think very often the United States surprised us, that is hard. And, and, and looking at the state of the world today, coming out of this uh, COVID pandemic, uh, economy rebounding, I think the last thing we would need now is even more instability, more uh, unpredictability. I think that's one element. Second element was very clear. Uh, Article 5 really put center stage. Article 5 is basically says if any of the partners is being attacked, there's an obligation to, uh, to support them. Made also very clear that only one country ever invoked Article 5, and that was the United States after 9-11. Uh, after, uh, after um, I think then the discussion afterwards is, is, is a rich, uh, rich discussion uh, where, where countries put their, uh, put their priorities, uh, priorities on the relation to, to Russia, priorities on the relation to, uh, to China, uh, priorities on, uh, on technological development, where I think the NATO countries really have to, uh, to, to, to make up some, uh, some, some backlog that we've, uh, that we've had. And then I think maybe as important as everything I said, emphasize that NATO is about defense, but it's also about values. And, and for me, one of the more striking uh, phrases that's been said is that someone said, well, the erosion of democracy, even within our own societies, is probably the biggest threat to which uh, NATO is being confronted. And, and I agree with that. There was a lot of discussion before the summit about the idea of a more political NATO. Mm -hmm. Of course, NATO was always a political institution, among other things. Um, but uh, one does, in fact, hear a lot uh, mm -hmm. about this. What, what struck you on that front? Uh, you know, a place where you know, key issues of the day are going to be the subject of consultation among mm -hmm. allies. What, what was on the agenda? Well, if, if you look at the agenda that uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg put, uh, put forward, the number one element in his uh, NATO 2030 strategy is consultation. And I think that is uh, important. I think too often over the, last, over the last years, NATO partners sometimes took decisions related to their security without consulting with other countries. That fragilizes a, a, a partnership. I mean, this is by far the most successful partnership ever built in, uh, in history. But if you see that countries are starting to make their own moves without, uh, without consulting, that fragilizes. And you see that, I mean, some other world powers over the last years have tried to divide NATO. Uh, any effort that tries to divide NATO and that is successful, every time it's a little piece that deconstructs the, 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 whole, uh, the, whole, uh, the whole structure. Um, that 
of course, and, and we are at an important moment. There is a NATO reflection uh, going on, and, and rightfully so. I mean, we're, we're not, the world has changed over the, last, uh, over the last 10 years. There is within the European Union also a reflection going on related to our Eastern partnership, related to our relation to, uh, to Russia. Um, I don't see one as a threat to the other. I, I really see it as an advantage. This is the right moment to do this analysis. The fact that this analysis is going on in parallel on both sides actually gives tremendous room for convergence, for, for a better division of labor and so on. But if you want NATO to be a, a, a partnership which is in equilibrium, then Europe needs to be clear. The European countries need to be clear about their own, uh, about their own priorities. What about China, Prime Minister? Mm -hmm. uh, NATO uh, seems to have gone from hardly any mention of China mm -hmm. uh, to a lot yep. today. Uh, how do you read that? Well, it's, it's, it's reflecting reality. China is a world power. It's a world power on the economic side. It's a world power on the, on the traditional uh, military side. It is a world power in, in cyberspace. There is absolutely no doubt uh, about that. I, thought, I think that the general tone was not a hostile tone. I mean, this was a tone where, okay, China is a factor in the, uh, in, in, in the world. And, and if I took, take the Belgian position, I mean, we are, we are open for business and open for relations with, uh, with China. But the key element for me is reciprocity. I'm okay if, if Chinese investments take place in, in, in our economy. And we have rules on critical infrastructure, of course, but all the rest, I'm, I'm open to that. But I want to be able to do the same in China. I want our companies to be to have their IP protected. I want to be protected against dumping practices and so on. And there, I think there is a, a degree of, of um, self-confidence on the European side that has been growing over the far, uh, past four years. I think the past four years have been difficult. But one of the things came out of that is that the European countries understood that we need to get out of the shadow of the United States. That does not mean that we are being divided. Mm -hmm. I think we need to do our own, own analysis on what our priorities are, what we think is important. If those priorities are convergent, which seems to be the case today, that's great. And no one, if, if we are aligned, no one can get around this. And, and we are a tremendous force in the world on uh, free trade. We're a tremendous force in the world on, uh, on, on respecting human rights, on democracy. I mean, there's so much we can do in the world. But if at some point in the future, who knows, we would not be aligned. Um, Europe, ne Europe needs to be able to stand on its own, uh, on its, uh, on its own legs. And I think in the end that that's a good thing for the transatlantic relationship. Prime Minister, thank you. It, it seems to me that also points very naturally in the direction of, well, the question of NATO-EU cooperation. Mm -hmm. And it seems that things are moving on that front as well. Yeah. Um, what came out of the summit today around that? I think that, that what came out of that is that um, one is strengthening the other. And, 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 and um, if you want NATO to function well, then the European Union needs to be able to be very clear um, on its foreign policy priorities. And, and we see that the economy is, is becoming way more geopolitical than it used to be. And, and we see that in the pharmaceutical sector, and, and we see it as Belgians. I mean, we are a vaccine powerhouse. If you look at the COVID vaccines in the world, somewhere around 15% of the worldwide production is coming out of, uh, out of Belgium. Why do we have that? Well, that's because, if I can say so, we're good. I mean, we have talent, we have a, uh, uh, an interesting um, environment, we, we, uh, we are stable, we're logistically well connected. We see that that is changing. We see that more and more countries are looking at pharmaceuticals from a geopolitical perspective. That's going to happen with microprocessors. We know that is going on. That's probably going to happen in a, lot of, uh, in a lot of domains. Now, we can do a lot of thinking. Is that a good thing or it's a bad thing? This, I think, is the lens that the world is going to look at, uh, at, the, um, uh, at the economy. And that means that we Europeans need to have that perspective as well. And we can set the tone. I mean, as a, as a trading block in the world, we are by far the number one trading block in the world. Well, maybe we need to start behaving as the number one trading bloc in the world. Up to now, we haven't really done that. And, and you feel that on the European level, there is a growing of consciousness on that. 
You know, the session before this one was focused very much actually on those issues related to defense industries in particular. It was all about innovation. And I'm wondering if maybe to say a few words about that because NATO also took some decisions today to set up a new uh, accelerator for innovation and, and some other things very much in the vein that you were just talking about mm -hmm. around vaccine development and other things in Belgium. Well, we, we, we see that uh, technology matters and technology matters in our health. It also matters in, uh, in, in, in defense. Um, and if you see at, at, at what is happening around the world, the, uh, in general, the NATO countries have, have some catching up to do. Uh, and so that NATO uh, plays a role in that and wants to accelerate uh, technological uh, development um, is, is, is a good thing. I mean, that has always been the case. If you look at, at defense, there is always a technological component to, uh, uh, to defense. Um, and actually it is already reflected if you look at the NATO statistics you see that over the last years the spending has gone up which was one of the uh, of the wishes uh, of the pledge in uh, in Wales but we also see that the investment in infrastructure has gone up uh, dramatically technology is everywhere and it's definitely here in this domain maybe touch just a few seconds on, on mm. cyber um, where I think I mean, if you today want to explain to the general population what's the benefit of being in NATO, I'm convinced that in the next year, cyber is going to be one of the elements. I mean, cyber security is a defense that we do. We do that on a daily basis. We get attacked on a daily, on a daily basis. And it is the type of attacks, the type of destabilization that could hurt our citizens in a very, uh, in a very direct way. So that domain, working together in that domain, Mutual, uh, mutual agreements in defense, sharing information in, 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 in uh, cybersecurity defense is, is, is a key one. Now, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you're going to meet with President Biden tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are you eager to hear? I mean, you, 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 you told us a bit about the atmosphere uh, in your earlier remarks, but what in particular would you be keen to hear from the president when you meet with him tomorrow? Well, we have a, a bilateral program tomorrow uh, between, between the United States and, uh, and, and, and Belgium. Um, I think what I, what I would like to talk about is, is for example, about vaccine production. Um, one of the things which, which I think was, was was frankly a mistake, is, is that the Biden administration invi uh, invoked the Defense Act uh, related to vaccine uh, production. Mm. And, and, and at first sight, I could understand that everyone wanted to produce vaccines. But if you look in detail, I mean, vaccine production is such a global thing. I mean, these are global value chains, uh, hundreds of different ingredients coming from all parts of the world. And that policy really hampered vaccine production worldwide. And we have seen it. Uh, if we see the production we have in Belgium, um, we account for 70% of the, of the export of vaccines in Europe. So we do a lot of, uh, of exports. And we've seen that, that our production was slowed down because of the America First uh, mm. attitude. And, and, and I really hope that we learn out of this and that we understand that uh, if, 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 I mean, this was about uh, production this about being it as seamless as possible. If you then get get roadblocks in global trade, that's not a good thing, and and it's to the detriment of everyone. If if now the G7 pledged one billion vaccines mm -hmm. for the rest of the world, we wholly support this. Uh, I think this is necessary. I think the current the current uh, pace of production towards the rest of the world, I think it's a disgrace that some countries would only be vaccinated in 2023. So it's great that that pledge has been made. But if you want to realize that pledge, then we should stop all uh, roadblocks um, on, uh, on, on, on the trade, the value chain towards um, vaccine production. Prime Minister, uh, thank you. I'm conscious of our time. Uh, perhaps allow me a final question. The NATO summit launched a process that's aimed at uh, revising the strategic concept over the next year. I mean, do you think that that's going to be an incremental result in the end, or are you looking for something more more profound, more revolutionary out of that? No, I think that this, this strategic exercise is, is, is really um, 
it's, it's a turning point and, and it, it reflects a world that really has, uh, has, has changed and I think it proves that history is not a straight line. I mean, sometimes it makes some, some, some curves and you sometimes go, go backwards and, and this, is, this is what we see that is, uh, that is happening. So we have high expectations on the, the, on the exercise that is being done in the next, uh, in, in the next years. We'll all be involved in, uh, in, in this and then who knows where we are in one year. I mean, what we have been confronted with the last year, no one, uh, no one uh, predicted uh, uh, this. One last element, if I can, if, I, if I, you let me say that, I would like to thank the German Marshall Fund for uh, for organizing this together with uh, with, with NATO. Uh, I think it's important to really bring these summits, like the NATO summit today, to bring it to the outside world and, and to show the discussion that is going on and, and to enable people to, to participate in the, uh, the discussion. So I'm um, a big fan of what you have, uh, have been or organizing <laughs> today and in the days that come. Prime Minister, thank you very much for those very kind words uh, and also uh, for your reflections on the day. Um, that's also a cue for me maybe to offer some thanks of our own, uh, if you'll allow me. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, to the Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs for uh, partnering with us, not just on this event, but also on Brussels Forum as a whole. Mm -hmm. We're really very, very grateful for that. Uh, and as we close the day, let me uh, also say uh, a few words of thanks uh, if you'll allow me. Uh, first of all, to NATO as a strategic partner, and, and in particular to our friends at the NATO Public Diplomacy Division, uh, to the Assistant Secretary uh, General for Public Diplomacy, Baiba Braza, uh, to Carmen Romero, to Nicola DeSantis, uh, to the whole public diplomacy team. We're really immensely grateful for your, uh, for your partnership, but also for your friendship and your help, and also to Benedetta Berti, uh, NATO's Head of Policy Planning, uh, for her contributions. It was a pleasure from start to finish, and we're really very, very grateful for that. But we're also not quite finished with Brussels Forum yet. It goes on for the rest, rest of the week. Um, and uh, I hope you'll join us for those conversations. Also, if you're watching us, please uh, look out for a survey that you'll receive uh, where you can give us some feedback on this event. Uh, we'd be very grateful for that. Uh, please do join us tomorrow. And also, you'll be able to um, uh, to join us, in fact, for a special, very informal event this evening, uh, which is Brussels Forum After Hours on Clubhouse. Thank you all again from Brussels.